We are live. Mar-a-Lago with President Trump. To kick off Super Tuesday tomorrow, it's my honor to for the next president of the United States, Donald J. Trump, joining us for the next uh, 45 minutes or so to talk about Super Tuesday. Well, it's going to be great. It's tomorrow. It's 15 states, and uh, I hear North Dakota's coming out tonight, and I think we're going to do very well there. The governor's fantastic, and two good senators, and uh, they're going to be announcing those results in about an hour, so we might not make it for this show, but I think they'll be good. And we've set uh, records, as you know, with almost every state, just about every state we've been in. We started with Iowa, and we went to New Hampshire, and we were just uh, knocking them dead. New Hampshire, we had the most votes in history. Iowa, we, ha we had the biggest margin in history times two. And uh, Nevada was a uh, record, all records. I mean, it's been — something's really fantastic happening out there, Brian. And uh, we're, we're very happy to be a part of it, all of us, all of us together. We're happy to be a part of it. Uh, the country wants help. They're screaming for help. I really believe it, with millions and millions of people coming in illegally, and they're coming from places unknown, and they're rough people, in many cases from jails, prisons, from uh, mental institutions, insane asylums. You know, insane asylum, that's uh, Silence of the Lamb stuff. Uh, these uh, <laughs> Hannibal Lecter. Anybody know Hannibal Lecter? <laughs> well, we don't want him in this country. And uh, terrorists, terrorists are coming in at numbers that we haven't seen in many, many decades. It's crazy what they're doing. It doesn't make sense. It makes no sense whatsoever. And we're going to turn it around. We're going to stop it. We're going to drill, baby, drill. We're going to get our prices down and our costs down. And we're going to close up the border, and we're going to have a big deportation, and we're going to get bad people out of here because we can't have it. We just can't have it. No, this is not sustainable by any mm -hmm. country ever at any time. There's never been anything like it. Three years ago, we had the safest border, the best border in the history of our country by far. Like, there was never anything like it. When I ran in 2016, it was very much about the border. But that border was like a baby compared to this border. This border is a disaster. But I fixed the problem and fixed it so well, I couldn't even talk about it in the 2020 election. And yet, we got millions of more votes. We actually did much better, I hate to tell you, we did much better the second time than we did the first time. And we don't have to get into what happened, but we all know what happened. It was a rigged deal, a terrible thing. Yeah. Terrible, terrible thing. And now you look at from uh, inflation to Ukraine and Russia, which would never have happened, to Israel being attacked. None of these things would have happened. It was uh, — inflation was caused by energy and by stupidity. You have Afghanistan. I think it was the most embarrassing moment in the history of our country, the way we left. Not that we were leaving. I was leaving. But we were going to get out with dignity and strength. We were going to have the equipment. We were going to keep it. We gave them $85 billion worth of equipment. You see what happened. Uh, they killed 13 of our people, and 38 — nobody ever mentions this, but 38 have been hurt so badly, you know, with the arms and the legs and just obliteration. It's uh, so sad to see what's happened to our country. So we're going to turn it around, and we're going to do it faster than anybody can imagine. And uh, we're going to make America great again. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. We've got uh, 854 delegates are up for tomorrow. So if you were to clinch this this early, this would have been on pace for what, what it was in 2020 when you didn't have anybody running against you yeah. and you didn't have all these lawsuits against you. Yeah. How does that make you feel about a party if we've come together to get you this nomination by March 17th? It's been pretty amazing, actually, and uh, it's a lot of love. There's more love now, and I think. A big part of it is, when I ran the last time, uh, we had a good record. We had the best economy ever. We had all these fantastic things that had happened. We had the safest border ever. We had low energy prices. We had, everything was going right. We were rebuilding our military, which I completed. We finished. Uh, we did everything right. It was amazing. And now we have something to compare what we're doing against. We didn't really last time, because we were doing well. We had, I said, the border was in great shape. I couldn't even talk about the border. They'd say, sir, don't talk about the border. You fixed it. 
and nobody wants to hear it. You know, that's the sad part. When you do something well, nobody wants to talk <laughs> about it. So I didn't talk about the border. But uh, now we look back and we see that we had a great border. We look back and we see we had a great economy. We had no inflation, essentially no inflation. Uh, everything was good, and we did such a good job. We had the greatest economy in the history of our country, probably in the history of the world. And now we have a horrible economy where inflation has hurt us probably close to 50 percent when you add it all up. I, I was told a little while ago, bacon went up four times in the last three years. I mean, four times what it was. And uh, other food products are through the roof. And, and they say that, you know, they're not going down. They may bring inflation down to 4 percent, 5 percent, what it is now. But they're not bringing down the damage that's been caused. And, and, you know, you take that, even if you get increases in salaries or whatever you may be doing, whether it's salaries or anything else, it's more than compensated for by the inflation, which is just ripping people apart. So the economy is terrible. And they say, and some real geniuses, I will tell you, some, some of the smartest people on Wall Street say, the only thing good is the stock market. And that's good because they think everybody thinks I'm going to be elected. So, and you're right. Yeah, you're right. You're right on that. And uh, very interesting. It's an yeah. interesting time. Well, we've talked, and you, yet you have the Biden administration trying to convince Americans that life is good, President Trump, yeah. that everything's affordable. But they know Bidenomics has destroyed it. It's been a disaster. It's a bad term. They thought it was a bad term when it came out, and then Biden liked it. He thought it was a nice name, and he started using it, and he was getting killed because it was really meant as a negative, not as a positive. And we have Maganomics, right? Maganomics. <laughs> And that is a good thing. And, you know, it's, it's so interesting. It's got to be one of the great uh, names because uh, you look through branding, whatever you want to call it, but you look throughout history. I don't think there's ever been anything like this. There has never been a movement like this, mm -hmm. possibly in any country, but there's never been a movement like this in our country. And the spirit, the love, and, and the positiveness and remember, when they hit us and they say, we're going to stop this mega stuff, mega, 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 that's <laughs> Joe Biden. And I say, Joe, what is it? Define it. And he's unable to define it. I guarantee if you ask him what does mega mean, he wouldn't know. It's make America great again, right? <laughs> so, so, so it's been pretty... Uh, been a pretty amazing time. Really okay. pretty amazing time. Let's talk about the polls. Now, the polling is, is huge right now. Yeah. And there's a lot of polls out that you're just absolutely destroying it, and you're set to you know, break every records right now so far. Virtually every player in the Republican Party has endorsed you at this point, which is huge. Now, why do you think you have such political strength right now? Because I think we did a great job, and people are longing for that uh, period of time that we had just uh, a little while ago wasn't long. And you know, the, the beauty is I heard just coming up, I was hearing a telecast and they said eight months. I said, I've been using nine and 10. Mm -hmm. We're so close now. We're actually getting close. The one thing I will say is, and I say it in speeches, that if you took the 10 worst presidents in the history of our country and you added them up, they have not done the damage that Joe Biden's done in his presidency. It's a disaster. He's been a disaster. He's the worst president in history. He's the most corrupt president in history most incompetent president in history. I don't know if he's going to make it to the starting gate, but if he does, he does. And if it's somebody else, it's somebody else. But there's never been anything like this. There's never been anything happening to our country. What they're doing is they're poisoning our country by allowing people to come in by the millions. I believe we have 15 million people now, and I think it could be close to 20 million by the time this whole horrible nightmare ends. And uh, we're going to have to just solve that problem. We talked about this earlier, about enthusiasm. And I often say that I think there's more enthusiasm this time around than it was in 2020. Now, President Trump, when you walk out to these rallies, and you see, you saw it in Greensboro, yeah. and you saw it in, in uh, Roanoke just a yeah. couple days ago, do you sense more enthusiasm from, from, from MAGA and the crowds and just the support that you get? Is it greater this time around? When you looked at North Carolina and Virginia this weekend, I tell you what, I've never been, and we've had rallies that are massive rallies. I've never seen love and, you know, excitement. Even this crowd, I just walked in, and I don't know if you caught it on air, but this crowd is a very nice crowd. This is a very nice crowd. <laughs> and, 
people. Thank you very much. But you know, it's very interesting because the New York Times uh, did a poll and just uh, blew them up. It just came out and they announced it and we're way up, leading big against Biden. And one of the questions they ask is enthusiasm. How enthusiastic are you for Biden, meaning Democrats or whoever? And the numbers are record low. There's very little enthusiasm. And very enthusiastic, that's a term. Very rarely do you have people very enthusiastic. We're up around 50%. And I said, boy, that's a phenomenal number, to be very enthusiastic about somebody. And then I'll listen to the fake news, and they'll say, while the both candidates aren't popular, I'm popular. I mean, they like me. They like me in the Republican Party. They do. I like them. But, you know, the fake news, they get out there, and they like to play it. I don't think he is popular, and he shouldn't be popular because of what he's done to the country. But we have a great love in our party. We have a great popularity. Uh, we had polls where I'm at 94, 95 yep. percent uh, approval rating in the P Republican Party. And I beat Ronald Reagan, who's at 86 percent. I mean, we're very popular in this party. This party is — and whether you call it MAGA or Common Sense or Trump or whatever it is, uh, this party is very unified, surprisingly unified. It's, it's pretty amazing. And that's why we're doing well. And to go to your original part of your question, I have never seen enthusiasm like this, including — so we ran in 2016, and we did great. And we won. We ran in 2020. We did much better by almost 12 million votes. 12 million votes. That doesn't happen. Usually, if somebody runs a second time, they get less. And they can win or lose, but they get less because, you know, people get bored and they get tired and they say, let's give somebody else. But normally, they get less or they get a little bit more. Uh, President Obama got a lot less, and he won a lot less. But rarely do you see it where you get massively more. And we have massively — millions and millions and millions more votes than we had — so, you know, than we had in, in 2016. Now, we were at 63 million. That was a lot in 2016. I was told that if you get the same by John McLaughlin, by Fabrizio, if you get the same number, 63 million, you can't lose. It's impossible to lose. We got millions more votes than that, and we lost just by a whisker, you know, just by a whisker. Now it was a rigged yeah. election, and it's a disgrace, and we're not going to let it happen again. Well, one of the. Yeah. One of the biggest issues that they're polling is our border and how it's so wide open and all the drugs. So you were just in Texas a couple days right. ago. We were down there covering that trip. Uh, that is polling number one across the country. And yeah. I go to every single rally and I talk to hundreds, if not thousands, of your supporters. And they tell me, and I want to ask them, what is the number one issue with you? And they say, I want President Trump on day one to close the border. Yeah. It's uh, number one, and it's usually not number one. Even in 2016, mm -hmm. it was two or three, but it wasn't number one. It's just not like normally a number one issue, because people would think you have at least a semblance of a border. We have nothing. You know, we built 571 miles of wall, which was a great achievement, much more than I said. Then I ordered an extra 200, because as you fill it up, they start walking a little bit longer distances and go around. So we ordered 200 more. We had it. It was delivered. And Biden, we then had the crazy election, and Biden wouldn't put it up. They wouldn't, and I said, whoa, what's going on? They wouldn't put it up. And I said, for the first time, I actually said, I really think they want open borders. I couldn't believe it. Because who would want open borders? You know, where people are coming from parts unknown, countries that you've never heard of, languages that nobody in this country speaks. You know, we don't even have teachers of some of these languages. Who would think that? We have languages that are like from, from the planet Mars. Nobody — nobody knows how to, you know, speak it. And then these students — and I'm not blaming them. I'm saying they put the students in the place of our students, like in New York City. We have these wonderful students. They're going to school. All of a sudden, they no longer have a seat. They're no longer invited to the school. We're putting migrants in who don't speak the language. They have no idea what the teacher is saying. And we have children that are no longer going to school. They're throwing them out of the park. There's no more Little Leagues. There's no more sports. There's no more life in New York and so many of these cities. When you have a half a million people just 
you know, just come down and invade your city, it is a very, very bad thing. And then, many of these people are very dangerous people. When I see cops fist-fighting, you know, I've seen cops over there, they get hit, and they get shot, and they get everything, and it's horrible. But I've never seen fist-fights. Think of it. A fist-fight, where guys are fist-fighting with cops in the street, and that's not as bad as being shot. You know what, in a certain way, it's really incredible because the nerve of these people, and if this happened in their country, they would be gone, they would be shot, and they'd be shot and gone within two minutes. They wouldn't allow this. But you saw what happened with the, where 10 guys are beating up cops in the middle of the street, kicking them and punching them. Uh, these are tough people, and they're not wanted by their country, and we don't want them either. We have to get them out. We have to get them out fast. It's migrant crime and it's going to reach a level that nobody has ever thought of or seen before. It's not like this beautiful picture of people coming across the border. These are people from jails and rough places, and they're rough people, and they're not going to work here. We're going to have a, a level of crime. We have a crime wave already. They're now getting situated. They're starting to feel comfortable. And instead of being this wonderful, idyllic deal, they're fighters, and they're killers, and they're drug dealers, and lots of things. Bad things are happening, and we have to get them out. No country can sustain what we're going through. Yeah, I agree. All right, let's talk about the battleground state polling since the presidency is won state by state. Now, we checked with real clear polling averages yesterday, and here's what's going on right now in these key battleground states. Now, let's go with Arizona. Uh, you're up 5.5 on that. Nevada, seven points. Wisconsin, the latest poll from Bloomberg Morning Council, was you're up four points there. Michigan up 3.6. North Carolina, 5.6. Georgia up 6.5. These are big numbers. And you know what? You talked about this earlier. The, the inner city, people that have, might have been agnostic to voting, they see what the policies under the Biden administration is doing to them, yep. and they're swinging over, and they're now saying, I'm going to vote for Donald J. Trump in this next election because they're tired of what's happening to them. So these polling numbers do not surprise me at all. So we're getting the highest numbers ever from African American, Hispanic American, Asian American. Women are looking good. You know, I kept hearing about women and suburban women. <laughs> suburban women. Some women here? Yeah. You know, you know what women want? They want security, they want safety. They don't want to have people pouring into our country. They don't want to have wars where their children are going out to wars. And think of it, you wouldn't have had Ukraine. I, I would bet that the numbers are going to be double or triple what you really, what you're saying. I agree. That is, you know, blow up those buildings and hear that nobody was injured as you, as this massive, they have big buildings. As massive buildings are tumbling down to the ground, hit by missiles, you don't say two people were hurt, two people were slightly injured. No, a lot of people were killed. A lot of people in those buildings, and a lot of people were killed. The numbers are going to be much, much greater. And when you look at that, to think that would have never happened. I talked to Putin a lot. I had a very good relationship with him. You know, the press goes crazy when you say that, by the way. Oh, you should. It's a good thing to have a good relationship, not a bad. But he understood. He couldn't do the Ukraine thing. And it was the apple of his eye. He couldn't do it. But when I was out, and I think after he watched the disaster in Afghanistan, I think he said, these people are grossly incompetent. I really think without Afghanistan, maybe he wouldn't have done it. But he looked at that where we take the military out first. We have Americans still living there as hostages, probably. It was so handled so badly. We left $85 billion worth of equipment, the best military equipment in the world, because I bought it. You know, I, I'm the one. You know about it. <laughs> no, I, I'm the one. I rebuilt the entire military. We had new, beautiful equipment, and they took a big chunk of it. Uh, it was one of the worst things. And when Putin and when President Xi of China looks at that and they see it, Kim Jong-un, when they look at it and they see that, uh, they are emboldened. And uh, that's a bad thing. Well, I think these strong polling numbers just indicate to everyone, plus the media and those naysayers out there and the people that are the Nikki Haley camp trying to encourage her to carry on, this says something, that the American people have faith in you and your policies, no one else. <laughs> that can turn this country around. Well, I've watched you know, whole group, they started off with probably 15, and I watched it, you know, one would go, another one. Some were very, 
expressive uh, like uh, North Carolina. Doug Burgum. Uh, he, was, he was great. And North Dakota, great. We have so many great people. Uh, I'll tell you, let's go to North Carolina. So South Carolina, North Carolina, you had some people. They fight for me like you've never seen. North Dakota, you have Doug Burgum, the governor. Mm -hmm. He is so fantastic. He is so fantastic. And I'm looking forward to getting that, uh, that, that vote. I want to see what it is. But, you know, we have uh, numbers that, if the projections are right, we're going to win by a lot. I just say to the people that are watching now, if you could, go out and vote, because it's not Haley. She's not a problem. Uh, I think she's very negative for the party, but she's not a problem in terms of winning, because we're winning by a lot. The only place we, we expected to lose was D.C., because that's the swamp. That was a... It's a badge of honor yeah. to lose. No, that, it actually. Is. We didn't do anything there. We sort of said, leave that alone. That'll be a good... Uh, that'll be yeah. a good... It's, uh, it's a very interesting place. If I won it, I would have said that could be a problem, because yeah. you know, a lot of people would say, what's this all about? But uh, we've won everything in record numbers. And tomorrow, uh, we could very well win every state in record numbers. That's what we're hoping for. But it's, it's so, thank you. It's so important because we have to send a signal. You know, November 5th is going to be, I think, the most important day in the history of our country because that's the election. And we're going to take our country back from these uh, fascists and communists and the people that are running our country. And I'm not even sure that it is Biden. I think it's other people. It's not Biden, because he goes to sleep at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> and they have the best of all worlds, because they have a guy that probably isn't too active. But uh, he's very active when it comes, though, to uh, weaponization and trying to sure. uh, hurt a political opponent through using the FBI and the DOJ and all. And the people haven't stood for it. It's an amazing thing. Who would have thought this would have happened? It's never happened before. First of all, that's never happened before in this country. But it's never happened before when somebody would have that happen and your numbers would go up. Every time I get indicted, my numbers go higher and higher and higher. Because the people understand it. They understand you know? that. They really understand it. Uh, let's talk about a national polling. Yesterday, Forbes had to write breaking news headline that said, quote, Trump opens largest ever lead in New York Times polling. So you're polling huge in that. And of course, you're beating Biden 48 to 43. We talked about this earlier. It's much higher than that. Um, this is almost greater numbers than you had in 2015, despite the lawsuits, despite how the news is constantly yeah. attacking you, you still lead in these polls. The people get it. The people are very smart. The people get it. I've seen it. And the nice thing is I have a voice, whether it's through you or through others. We ha I have a voice, and I'm able to explain it to people. It's weaponization, and it's very common in third world countries and banana republics. It's a very common thing, but we never had it in this country where they come out and are nothing, or nonsense. Look at Fawny, you know, Fawny is F-A-N-I. She indicted me. She wanted to indict U.S. senators for doing nothing. Indicted me for doing nothing. And it was her and a boyfriend, and he got almost a million dollars. He had no experience, no nothing. Knew him a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Then she said something to the effect, I, I don't know much about the gentleman. They had 2,000 phone calls. I said, you know, I'm not sure I ever called the first lady 2,000 times, and <laughs> I've been with her for a long time, I think. And they have thousands of text messages, right? But she's not sure whether or not she knows him. Uh, the whole thing is a con job. You look at what's going on in Manhattan, where Hillary Clinton, think of it, Hillary Clinton's lawyer with a big law firm leaves the firm to go into the DA's office to prosecute me. Then he leaves the DA's office and he writes a book. He writes a book. Before anything was done, he's writing a book. I mean, how illegal is that? Or take uh, deranged Jack Smith. He's a deranged person. And look at his record. He's been overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously. These people are bad people. They were set out to do a number on me, to damage me, so that Biden could beat me, because that's the only way he can beat anybody, because mm -hmm. he's damaged. I mean, he's really damaged goods. And you know what he should do? He, they're all his prosecutors. Uh, they work for him, like Fawny and her lover, went to Washington and spent at least two days that they know of, eight-hour days in the White House uh, counsel's office or the DOJ. So they were working on this a long time, in conjunction with Joe Biden's White House. Uh, the uh, DA's office has one of the top people from 
the Justice Department, that's Washington, in other words, Merritt Garland's people, put their top person in the DA's office to handle this case. And it's a, non it's a nonsense case. You know, every legal opinion I've read said it's not even a crime. It's not a crime. It's not this. It's not that. It should never be brought. Should have never been. None of these things should have been brought. But it's all being, all of these indictments are Biden indictments. And they're there to hurt an opponent. If I weren't running, this, none of this stuff would have ever happened. Or if I was doing badly, I would say it probably wouldn't happen. But all of this was done to inflict harm on his political opponent. And we've never had that in this country. It's something that's quite well known, but uh, it's in other countries, not in this country. This is a big example. And honestly, what he should do is take all of those prosecutors off the cases and fight a really fair fight. We're going to win anyway, one way or the other. We're going to win anyway. But they should fight it fair, because it's so bad for, for the country. And people know what's happening. They see it. If they didn't see it, I'd be down at nothing. I'd be absolutely nothing. They get it, and they see weaponization. It's an attack on a political opponent. Using the FBI and the DOJ, they raided Mar-a-Lago. That's against Fourth Amendment. I mean, they raided my house. Nobody's ever seen anything like that before. Uh, we are in a very dangerous time in our country. The only thing I can say is that we had it going so good in the four years that I was there that people were calling on the left, very strong, I would say the radical left, and they wanted to get together because African Americans, Hispanic Americans, everybody was doing better than they've ever done before. And all of a sudden, everything was coming together. Mm -hmm. And tremendous things happened, tremendous things and tremendous success. And now when you look at what's going on, like uh, the border, when I say I took over in 2016 and the border wasn't good, Brian, it wasn't good, but it was like normal not good. It was, you know, not a good situation, but it was now it's probably a hundred times worse. Nobody's ever seen anything like this where people are coming up by the millions. They have a caravan that's coming up now with 25,000 people in it. And you know, these dictators and, and presidents and others, they put their rough people in there. They don't want them in their jails. They empty out their jails. They empty out their institutions. Because You know the money they save by not having it? They had jails that were bursting at the seams, and now their jails are the emptiest they've been in 35 years, but they're going to get a lot emptier because they're dumping them into the United States. And these are very dangerous people, and we have to stop it, and we have to get the, the bad ones out immediately, and everybody has to go home because no country can sustain it. Our country can't sustain it, and our country's going to hell. We've been living in hell and we're going to change it, and we're going to change it fast. I want to talk. Yeah. He's right. I want to talk about you potentially winning the popular vote, but real quickly, you talk about these law cases, these law, these all these legal cases. When you go into the courtroom and you see all the supporters outside the courthouse, how does that make you feel? Because you're going into a court of law, and you know you're being persecuted for crimes you didn't commit. No. These are all f false allegations. But yet you still have supporters outside with Trump flags and pe great people like we have here tonight. How does that make you feel? Well, I, not only outside, inside. I'm in the courthouse and <laughs> I'm walking past the police and the security people and all, 2024, sir, 2024. They go, 20, 2020. We're with you, sir. We're, this is inside. This is inside. But. We have some real Trump haters. Uh, we have some judges that are real Trump haters at, at a level that you wouldn't even believe. Sure. We have uh, prosecutors that are Trump haters. Again, at a level you wouldn't believe the hatred. You wonder, how could they possibly have this kind of hate? I don't know them. And we've done a good job. I was a very popular president. I mean, we were, I got the most votes of any sitting president in United States history. I mean, I was a popular president. We did a good job. Biggest tax cuts in history biggest regulation cuts in the history of our country. All of the things we did, safest borders, we had numbers that were incredible, even from a medical standpoint, right to try. I have so many people that are living right now because for 50 years they were trying to get, you know, we have space age materials, some great, great medicines. We have labs and doctors that are incredible. And they're way ahead, but they won't be approved for four or five years by the FDA. 
And I said, well, why aren't we giving a person that's terminally ill, why aren't we giving them some of this uh, medicine? Maybe it'll work. And it was a very hard thing, actually. It sounds easy, but it wasn't, because the insurance companies didn't want it for obvious reasons. The medical companies and labs didn't want it, because if it doesn't work, you know, and people are mm -hmm. terminally ill. And I, I worked a deal where you don't have to put it down here. You can put it down on a separate list. In other words, so it won't look bad on your so-called report card. And I got the insurance companies aboard. You sign a document, you're not going to ever sue the country. You're not going to sue. And you have access. So instead of going to Asia or going to Europe or going wherever you may go or going home and dying if you have no money. A lot of people can't go to Asia, Europe to seek a cure. And we are saving thousands and thousands of lives. It's great. It's great. Yeah. You are. Okay. Let's, let's talk about winning that popular vote. How would that make you feel to win the popular vote? Well, look, we have a couple of problems in this country. Number one, mail-in voting. Mail-in voting will always be dishonest, okay? Mm. And it's a shame that we have it. Uh, Jimmy Carter did a report, along with a couple of other senators that were respected, Democrats, Republicans, it's like a commission. And the end result of the report was never go to mail-in voting. It will always be dishonest. That was a long time ago. France fairly recently switched from mail-in voting to one day paper ballots, voter ID, very simple. One day voting. I mean, these elections where they take 61 days and then they want an extension. And you know, they use machines to count it fast, but nobody ever had a, I mean, they last weeks longer. And then you wonder what's happening and how come that material was moved and it was there and where is it now? Now, we have to have fair elections. We need two things very strongly. We need fair elections and free elections, and we need borders. If a country doesn't have borders, you're not a country. And we really don't have either. But when you have mail-in voting, think of what the process is. They send an envelope to someplace. I mean, so many people complain. They get seven or eight votes. Some don't complain. Some just send them back in, right? Mm -hmm. But they get many votes. They get many uh, ballots. And so many of them sign them. They just keep signing them. Mm -hmm. And who's bringing them there? Who's bringing them back? What happens in the meantime? Are they sold? Because you know ballots are sold during this process. People are selling them that are delivering them. So many bad things happen. I think that, you know, I went to California, had this massive crowd. I said, why would I lose California? Automatically, because you're a Republican. Why would I lose California? Look at this crowd. It's as big as we've ever had. Or New York. I think I'd do well in New York if we had everything was on the up and up. And by the way, we're putting a heavy move on New York because New York is not the same place. New York was unhappy three years ago, but New York is really unhappy now. Yeah. Well, and I think we can do Lee Zeldin. Yeah. Well, Lee Zeldin did a good job. I think, I think you're right. It's a lot worse now. Yeah. Well, let's getting back to the latest New York Times poll, aside from your biggest lead ever in the national popular vote, is Biden's 25 points down from his 2020 numbers yeah. with working class minority voters without college degrees. Uh, it showed up you winning Hispanic voters 46 to 40. It also showed you winning 23% of black voters. Now you've gained black voters uh, than, than you had in 2020. What does that make you feel to really get down in the inner cities and, and, and show the, this, these demos that your policies will promote them uh, despite what the Democrats would say? So it makes me feel great. Like as an example, with black voters, uh, Romney got four or 5%, Mitt Romney, okay? I'm not a big fan of his, by the way. He got four or five. But I did a lot of things uh, like criminal justice reform, opportunity zones and cities with Tim Scott, who's fantastic, by the way. And I tell Tim all the time, you know, he ran as a candidate, and he did fine. But as my surrogate, he, he's unbelievable. I said, you do a much better job fighting for me than you did fighting fight for, for yourself. yourself. <laughs> he said, I always had trouble fighting for myself, but I like to fight for people that I think can do a great job. He's great. But... Uh, we did things that were incredible. I mean, criminal justice reform couldn't have been done. They came to see me, a group of people, and they were crying. Can I have help? Yeah. They were crying. And I was able to get conservatives to go along with it. And we got criminal justice reform. And I will tell you, the group that most wanted it was the black population because, you know, it's... Uh, Pretty rough stuff, what's, uh, what's been happening if you look at sentencing and sentencing guidelines, et cetera. So I got criminal justice wrong. We did so much. Historically, uh, if you look at the colleges, 
keep colleges and universities black. They would come to see me, the heads of these colleges, and I got to know some of them. But the first year they came to see, I said, what are you guys doing here? We came to get money from Congress because we can't run our schools if we don't know. Oh. Next year, the same group came. They said, yeah, we're here to get money. I said, wait a minute, do you do this every year? And they said, yeah, we do this every year. We have to. And one of them said to me, it was bad. He said, I feel like a beggar because they make us come back every year. This is the Democrats. And I said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to sit down. You're going to tell me what you need. And we're going to do a long-term plan for you. And I got them done with a long-term plan. And I added 20% to the number that they asked for. And they loved me. I said, the only thing, the only problem I'm going to have is I've gotten to like some of you guys. And I'll never see you again, probably. But you know what? I took care of them. And now you have your black colleges and universities are well-funded because of me. They were never going to get it. They were never going to get that. Yeah. Thing. And, and those are things that the mainstream media won't tell voters. You know, they, they really hide a lot of the accomplishments you had during your, your 2016 administration. You did help out uh, the, the, the black voters and Hispanic voters. Hispanics were making higher wages than they've ever made. They had the best four years they've ever had. Very entrepreneurial yeah. people. Very entrepreneurial. Yeah. But it's true. So, so uh, main, they're, they're amazing and, and very entrepreneurial. Uh, in fact, I don't even want to do business deals with these people. They're too good. <laughs> but, you know, they had the best four years. That, a lot of small businesses, and they had the best four years they've ever had. So everybody did. Everybody did. Every group. So you feel like this time you're making some really good inroads. With I do. And, and the big thing is we have to stop the cheating. I, I don't need votes. We have all the votes we need. We have to stop the cheating. Um, because I actually think that, I actually think we would win the popular vote if it was, if God came down and was your vote counter, where it would be honest, I think we win the popular vote. But they've cheated for years. Look, who can win with open borders, with high interest rates, you can't buy a home, with woke military? We defeated ISIS. We got rid of the worst terrorists in the world. We did things. And we had no wars. I got into no wars. Everybody said, I remember Hillary Clinton during a debate, she said, look at this man. He's going to cause wars. Look at his attitude. Look at his fresh mouth. I said, no, my fresh mouth is going to keep us out of wars. And that's what happened. <laughs> yeah. That's what happened. So we had no wars, but we defeated ISIS. Think of it. Yeah. We defeated ISIS in four weeks, and it was supposed to take four or five years. I went to Iraq, and I met with uh, a lot of different generals, but one named Raisin Kane. I said, you're my kind of guy. If that's <laughs> General Raisin Kane. We bought, we, we went in. We wiped them out, and we did it fast. We have the great, I tell that story tonight because we have the greatest military in the world, but we have a lot of people that want to be politically correct, or they don't know what they're doing, or they're weak, or they're stupid. Mm -hmm. But we have the greatest military in the world, and don't worry about the woke that you hear, because it's just, they do want it. I got rid of a lot of people that taught woke. They were making 400000 a year, 500000 They were getting paid a fortune. I fired them all. But when Biden came back, he hired him back. But the military is tough, and they're not going woke. Yeah, they're not going woke. I said this earlier about whoever is in control of Congress in January 2025 will control and rewrite the tax codes yeah. that everyone is benefiting from you right now. Um, let's talk about taxes. Okay. Let's talk about people keeping more of their money and how important that is to achieve the American dream. So I'm very proud to say that I got the biggest tax cuts in the history of our country, bigger than Ronald Reagan tax cuts, which were very big, but substantially bigger. And that's one of the things, I think, between that and the regulation cuts, where you didn't have to go through, you know, years of study to find out that that's a piece of dirt and there's no problem, okay? <laughs> I mean, it was the craziest thing. And we did regulation cuts larger than any other president has ever done by double or triple. And I think that was actually more important. You know, it's interesting. I, I was with a big businessman the other day. I said, what was better for you, the tax cuts or the regulation cuts? He said, it's not close to regulation cuts. That's why we had the best job numbers that this country has ever had. We had the best job numbers that we ever had. And regulation cuts and tax cuts. So with the taxes, you could keep your money. You were spending less money. And the funny thing is, everyone said, oh, you cut them too much. You're not going to take in the revenues. We had, right after the tax cuts, we had the largest number of, in terms of revenue, 
We had the biggest revenues, the greatest revenues that the country's ever had because people were incentivized. They were incentivized to go and work and everything else. Now, the Democrats want to raise your taxes by four times. And I don't know if people know it. You know, it used to be that if you could cut taxes, you were a pretty good politician, you were going to get elected. We're living in a different time. They want to raise your taxes, and they think that's good politics. So they want to raise your taxes. They want to give you a lousy education. They want to give you very unsafe streets. All of these things. And they want to have open borders. Mm -hmm. Open borders. You can't have the open borders. So I think we're on a path to get tremendous numbers of votes. Yeah, I, and, and the enthusiasm, as you said, and as some of your people just said, uh, there has never been, I don't think in any campaign, people say, you know, I have veterans that have been with me for a while, but they've been in this business, in this world of politics for a long time. I have one that's been through many campaigns. He said, there's never been anything like what he's saying now. If we drive, we're now in Florida, if we drive five blocks, every house has a Trump sign in front of it. It's really a great honor, I have to tell you. It's a beautiful honor. It's true. That's the reason why we're doing this preview show tonight, to encourage you guys tomorrow to get out and vote. We can talk about all the accomplishments of President Trump. We can talk about the policies. We can talk about how he's going to make America great again. But guess what? If you don't vote tomorrow, you don't encourage your friends, family, people at church, your neighbors, your co-workers to do it, it simply will not happen. You say this during your rallies, and I love the sign. It says, too big to rig. Right. We want to be too big to rig. But the, the too big to rig, we're really thinking about November 5th. But it really does send a signal, if you can, get out to vote tomorrow. Get your husband, get your wife, get your friends get their friends, because we want to send a signal that we're coming. This freight train's coming. And we have to do that, and we have to do it tomorrow. Tomorrow's the big day. Tomorrow, they call it Super Tuesday for a reason. And uh, I think it's going to be record-setting. I think. I hope so. But that sends the signal, because what we're really doing is we're aiming at that November 5th date. And I said it at the beginning, and I'll say it now as we close up. It's going to be, I think, the most important date the most important date and day in the history of our country. We're going to take our country back. And if we don't win this next election, I think our country is finished. I really do. I think it's finished. Yeah. So we got to act like we're down because the Democrats want to actually drag this out. So you get out and vote. Have the mindset that you are down by 70. You're not up by 70. And Republicans can stop by uh, to turn out in big numbers, delivering big margins, so we can get this uh, out to the rest of the company. Before you leave, I want to ask you about this Trump caucus yeah, captain hat sure. you got here. It's a good-looking cap, isn't it? It is. In fact, really I, wore, I wore one the other day. So this really comes out of Iowa because they did an incredible job. We went there. It was 40 degrees below zero, by the way. 40 degrees. Um, this was real cold. This was serious cold. Right. But the caucus captains were incredible. They got the people out. And we sort of do it with other places, even if it's not a caucus. It just works out well, right? Trump caucus captains. And what they've done was amazing in Iowa. And frankly, even though it wasn't a caucus, it was a primary. In New Hampshire, uh, you look at, uh, well, you spoke of Nikki Haley. We, just, we went to South Carolina, where she was the governor. And we beat her in record numbers. We, it wasn't even a contest. And that tells you something. When somebody's not really very popular in a place that they were governor, that they ran for a pretty long period of time, but we won record numbers. What we're doing as leaders and leadership, we give this hat. And it's been sort of lucky. So I said, whether it's a caucus or a primary, let's use it anyway. It looks there really go. good. I like that. All right, so as we wrap it up, the key takeaway here is get out and vote and make sure you uh, you tell all your friends and family, because right now we have to do that. You can visit DonaldJTrump.com slash Super Tuesday to find a location in your voting area. All of us here would like to say thank you for your, for your time tonight. Pretty nice.
once again, that website, DonaldJTrump.com slash Super Tuesday. The information for that is on your screen tomorrow. Super Tuesday, get out and vote, and let's take this Trump train down in November and get him back in the White House. Thank you for joining us on this special occasion. We'll see you next time. Thank you. 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 Thank